classes in polymer dynamics based on George Philly's book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And today, this lecture is Lecture 22, Viscosity. I'm Professor Phillies, and this is the next lecture in our series on Phenomenology of Polymer Dynamics. Today we're going to continue with our discussion of viscosity. Viscosity is the resistance of a liquid to pouring. The larger of the viscosity, the slower things pour. As the old saying goes, as slow as molasses in January. I'm going to begin with a general philosophical observation. That is, we're going to be looking at a very large set of measurements, different measurements, of viscosities of various polymer solutions. And the question the student might reasonably ask is, do we really need to look at quite all those measurements? There's a fundamental philosophical question here. There's a question of approach. The starting point is fairly straightforward. Suppose you have some theoretical model, and you would like to convince people that the theoretical model is right. Well, one of your several legitimate choices is to say, I have the model, I will look around for a few experiments done by people who I think are good, I will claim these are the key experiments that test the model, I will drop in the few key experiments as the test, and I will stop. Now, and there's nothing wrong with that. Or you can say, I'll look at a few sample studies, and if things work, that's good enough. Now, the strong point of that is that it saves you an enormous amount of work. After all, phenomenology of polymer solution dynamics, uh, before it was edited down for length, I edited it down for length a bit, was 220,000 words. It was approaching 300 figures. Uh, the collected papers that I analyzed to do this fill a four-drawer filing cabinet. Uh, the section of papers on a typical topic ranges from something this thick to something this thick. And clearly, if I'd only done a sample, I could have quit much earlier. However, <clears throat> there are certain problems with that approach. And if you are ever, ever tempted to follow it, you should realize what some of the problems are. The first difficulty is that if you only show a few experiments, anyone who disagrees with you will claim that you were cherry-picking. You didn't fake your measurements, but you selected from the universe of measurements a small number of measurements that really agreed well with your theory. And if you had only looked at a larger collection of papers, say six instead of three, it would have become obvious that the three measurements you looked at um, were not very good, and the measurements that were valid were out of a much larger set. Or rather, the measurements that are valid are a much larger set, and the measurements you looked at are a teeny tiny subfragment of the large set of measurements. Well, that's a major problem with looking at only a few papers. The next issue with only looking at a few papers is that people may, without being quite so aggressively critical as to saying you were unfair in your selection, take the position, well, yes, but I know there are a large number of measurements, most of which I did not just hear about. And if I look at those large number of measurements, I, I know without really looking that the model I believe in is really right. Um, well, the way you knock people out of that is systematically to reanalyze everything and leave these people no room on the chessboard, so to speak, in which to claim that uh, their data is, their model is really right. It just ha doesn't happen to agree with a few data sets, but we don't have to look at it in detail. The last virtue of looking at all of the measurements is that if you look at all of the measurements and do fits to the theory, in general you end up with a few extra parameters. Parameters whose um, dependences on molecular weight and other factors you can now study systematically. Uh, the virtue of doing that is that if you do look at lots of measurements, the important trends become transparent. And you can then advance to the next step of asking how you understand those trends. That is, you can use the analysis, if you've got enough of it, 
You can do meta-analysis, see what is revealed by all of the measurements put together, but not individual measurements separately, and you are driven in a direction that helps you take the next theoretical steps towards understanding what's happening. So that's what we, I did what I did, and as you will see, there are vast numbers of viscosity measurements, and you're going to see most of them. We start off, example 12.1, figure 12.1, and this is work of Jameson and Telford. And they are looking at polystyrene in tetrahydrofuran. This is as classical a polymer system as you can look at. They looked at materials ranging in molecular weight from 0.39 to 7.8 megadaltons. <clears throat> And having done this, their viscosity measurements cover about four orders of magnitude. Their measurements, the measurements look like that. They look like stretched exponentials. You can look at the figure, which is, of course, much more precise than my sketch, and you can see, yes, the, the stretched exponentials really describe the measurements accurately through all concentration studies. Now, of course, perhaps you'd like another set of measurements. Um, I'm not going to do every figure in the text. After all, if I talked about all of them, you might be tempted not to buy my book. And therefore, I will cut ahead to figure 12.3, which is due to Enomoto et al. And in fi figure 12.3, what we see are viscosities of schizophilans. Now, schizophilans have the important virtue, they're a biopolymer, they're very different from polystyrene. We're now in water rather than an organic solvent. But once again, the molecular weight range that was studied was 128 kilodalton out to 4.3 megadalton. That is, the experimenter had a series of samples each of which separately appeared to be monodispersed. And what they were able to do was for each of them measure the viscosity as the concentration was changed. For schizophilans, for a given material, uh, the viscosity changed by about five orders of magnitude over the observed range of concentrations the observed range of concentrations varied by about a factor of 10 squared. Um, you can always wish for measurements to higher viscosity and higher concentration, but you should realize it's very difficult to work with highly concentrated polymers, and eventually, unless there is a strong reason for doing so, we'll see a few studies that did that, it becomes hard to justify just pushing on just to say that you've been there. The nice curve, once again, is a stretched exponential, and the concentration dependence of each of the viscosities of each of these molecular weights of the same polymer lies on a stretched exponential. There is one last reason why it is useful to look at large numbers of different measurements, as we are now doing. And the reason is that viscosity, unlike a number of other physical parameters that we've studied, does not show a single universal phenomenology. In fact, it shows two different phenomenologies in different sets of materials. It's not quite clear why it does so, but it does. If you only had looked at a few sets of measurements, you might not have realized that there are two different phenomenologies out here for different systems. And because there are two different phenomenologies, uh, there's a physical conclusion to be drawn. It's very easy to concoct a physical model, I've done so myself, in which you say, here is a simple physical picture of polymer chain. It's a snake in a bamboo grove. 
It's a bag of beads, and the beads can't escape because they're inside a water-passing bag. Uh, but whatever the model is, it takes a very simple picture of a polymer coil that looks to be the same for all polymers. One does calculations on it, and one gets predictions which look to be the same for all polymers. Well, that's fine, except if you've just done that, you have sort of just predicted that there ought to be a universal behavior of um, viscosity versus polymer concentration. And as it turns out, there isn't. There are two different sets of universal behavior for two different sets of systems. It's not quite clear, so far as I know, why you get two different sets of behaviors. Uh, one interpretation is um, that there is, if you think in terms of renormalization groups, there are two competing fixed points, and in some systems one fixed point wins at all concentrations, and in other systems one fixed point wins at lower concentrations, and a different fixed point wins at higher concentrations. And that, that meta description, which unfortunately doesn't carry much further yet, uh, does explain what you actually find. Nonetheless, the important issue is that there are two sets of phenomenologies for polymer viscosities, and therefore any physical model has to have some room someplace to explain why this is the case. Okay. <clears throat> So let us chug ahead, and let us chug ahead to figure 12.5. 12.5 is a merger of four different sets of figures on very different materials. Um, we can make several different comments about it. Uh, for example, in figure 12.5b, we have dextrans. The dextrans have a range of molecular weights from 330 kilodaltons 334 up to 2660 kilodaltons. We see, once again, stretched exponential curves describing the concentration dependence. This time, the range of viscosities covered is quite large, larger than some, than some of the other data sets. Uh, an interesting point to be made, if you look at those measurements, and this is true of each of the other sets of measurements we have, very clearly the points lie on a smooth curve. And I, they lie on a smooth curve if we are plotting log viscosity versus log C. Now the statement, the points lie on a stretched exponential curve, doesn't absolutely prove that the stretched exponential is the answer you're looking for. After all, it could be the case that there is some other function that gives you very nearly the same shapes, but has a different mathematical structure underneath. Um, finding such a function would be an interesting exercise. However, while the data doesn't necessarily prove that a single set functional form is right, it does serve to disprove forms that predict different shapes of the curve. For example, something that predicted that log eta goes as cosine of log c. I'm not sure why anyone would expect this. Well, that's clearly ruled out by the measurements. On the same line, any model that predicts that the viscosity goes as c to the x at these concentrations that extend down to zero, any model that predicts that down to lower concentrations is very clearly ruled out because c to the x would lie on a straight line on the figure and very definitely the measurements do not lie on straight lines. You may argue as to what they do lie on, but there are certain things that they very definitely do not lie on. Okay. Staying with figure 12.5, we look very briefly at figures 12.5, C, and D. And the issue in C and D is that here we have plotted log viscosity versus linear concentration. Now, 
the linear plot has the di uh, for concentration has the disadvantage that if you cover a very large range of concentrations, say 10 to the minus 2 up to 100 grams per liter, the points down here tend to get crammed together. The advantage of this form, though, is that it's a semi-log plot. What do semi-log plots do? Semi-log plots take exponentials e to the a c to the first power. and they turn the simple exponentials into straight lines. The measurements, of course, do not lie on straight lines on this plot. They lie, lie on things that curve off. And the curvature away from the straight line is the fact that we are looking at a stretched exponential with e to the a, c to the new behavior, or in terms of log eta versus log c, something that curves off like this. Minor pause. It's very tempting to say, well, we could take a log, we could take a log of a log, we could do all sorts of things. And you should remember that you're starting out with measurements that are probably accurate to some number of percent, 1 percent, 5 percent, a tenth of a percent, whatever. Uh, if you have measurements that are accurate to about the same fractional error, on a log plot, the error bars, because are going to be about the same size everywhere along the curve. That is, if the error is a percentage of the value, when you take the log, the log of the error is sort of linear and log of the value and the error bars are the same size. That's what the human eye expects to be able to handle when it looks at a graph and asks, is, are the measurements on the graph consistent with the line? The human intuition sort of expects all the data points to be the same, roughly similarly equally accurate, and to have error bars of about the same size. If you keep manipulating measurements, say, Suppose we plotted, as you could certainly do, log of log of eta. We could do that. And if you blow up the vertical scale enough, it will vary quite impressively. However, if you do that, you should realize that when you take the second logarithm, you distort the size of the error bars relative to this. And in terms of the display of points on the graph, some sets of measurements are much more accurate than others in terms of how big the error bars appear to be. The alternative way of handling this is to do nonlinear least squares or weighted linear least squares where you can put in correct weighting coefficients. So if different measurements are accurate to different degrees, you can account for that in asking what sort of curve fits the measurements. And with that, we advance to figure 12.7. Figure 12.7 are results of Sakai et al. You are looking at oh, 60 to 3300 kilodalton. And these are polyalpha methyl styrenes. Uh, the issue here is wide range of molecular weight. <clears throat> Again, a log per log log plot, viscosity versus concentration. And once again, you see smooth curves. That is, once again, the stretched exponential form accounts for the behavior of the measurements. So, um, gee, what does this tell us? It tells us, um, same as the other stretched exponentials do, uh, we can advance from there to uh, what's next? Figure 12 point, I think it's 8. 
have polystyrene and aerochlor. Aerochlor is a mixture of uh, chlorinated biphenyls. It's a, an effective polymer solvent. The advantage and disadvantage is that it can be quite viscous. And this allows you to move phenomena into a time scale that your instruments can handle. It's also of interest in its own right. Um, the measurements, well, you're looking at a 10 to the 4 change in the viscosity. And the change in the slope, that is the degree of curvature you're seeing in the figure, are, it's a bit limited. However, you very clearly are seeing curvature. You are not seeing straight lines. Same message applies. OK, let us advance on. And we will advance on. I said, remember, viscosity shows two different phenomenologies. What are the two different phenomenologies that viscosity shows? Well, one of them is a single stretch, a simple stretched exponential. In some systems, you can find them in the figures, you have an issue that you have a stretched exponential behavior and it works fine, except at very low concentrations there will be a few points that rather consistently lie below the stretched exponential curve. However, let us push ahead and let us look at the other phenomenology. And the other phenomenology is the solution-like melt-like transition. I shall first draw a picture. Viscosity, this will be a log scale again, concentration. And we have a stretched exponential behavior. And then at some concentration, there is a crossover. So down here, we have e to the alpha, c to the nu. And up here, we have a straight line. We rather clearly have, do have power law behavior, c to the x. And you are able to describe, through the use of two functions, this curve with great precision. Uh, the first experiments to recognize that there is a solution-like, melt-like transition uh, were done by Taiho Lin, who was my one Michigan graduate student, who is now at Tsinghua University, National Tsinghua University in Taipei. There are the measurements. That's what it looks like. And what happens is you're taking up the, you're running up the concentration, and suddenly you can't get the stretched exponential to fit very well. Now, there's always a question: Is you're now using two different functions? Is this real, or is this some sort of an artifact? Also, if you say there's a crossover here, is the crossover really there? Or is the crossover someplace else, and your choice of concentrations generates various other artifacts? The answer on the question, where is the crossover, and how accurately can you measure it, is readily settled by choosing a variety of different points for the crossover, fitting the, con the material at lower concentrations to the stretched exponential, and the, the measurements at the higher concentration to the power law. Now, what's going to happen if you do that? Well, suppose I move the cutoff this way. The same argument applies in the other direction. So I've moved the cutoff to down here. The stretched exponential measurements continue to fit quite accurately, because after all, the data fit a stretched exponential beforehand. However, you're now trying to fit on this graph, it's a straight line, to something part of which is a straight line and part of which is a curve moving away from the straight line. And as you move the 
cutoff point away from the right location to the wrong location, uh, the RMS error in this fit blows up. It blows up because you're trying to force measurements that don't look like your function to agree with your function. Uh, if you go in the other direction, you have the same pr problem, namely the stuff up here does fit a power law, so if you keep fitting it to a power law, it still works. But the stretched exponential rapidly diverges from the power law, and so when you move the cutoff to up here, the fit in this region is not going to be good. It distorts the stretched exponential to get the best agreement you have. And once again, the RMS error in the fit goes up quite dramatically and rapidly. Uh, Carol Quinlan and I continued this analysis with Carol Quinlan's data. And these data were quite emphatic. There is a correct place for the fit, for the transition. And if you put it someplace else, you're obviously doing something. Okay, so that is the notion. That is why you think there is a transition. We discussed a great deal of work on optical probe diffusion and on light scattering from hydroxypropyl cellulose. That's in the chapter on probe diffusion. And these were all studies done by Kirill Streletsky in our lab. And by studying how probes move through polymer solutions and by studying light scattering by the polymer itself, we found a large number of optical spectroscopic features, all of which agree that there is a crossover, and all of which agree that the crossover is about at the same place. OK. Let us push ahead first and look at an absolutely wonderful set of measurements due to tau at all. And Tau et al. measured polymer viscosity over what was, in fact, a full range of concentrations. Now, they plot in terms of volume fraction of polymer, and they went out to a volume fraction of 1. That is, they were actually looking at the melt. At the other end, they got down to at least 0.2. And what they said was, our measurements agree well with power law forms. If you start out at the melt and work down, you see power laws. And I have, in fact, done this. I have been a little more conservative than Tao et al. were in extracting and saying how far down the clean power law forms extend. If you wanted to argue they go further, you could. However, I, took, I stopped where it was very clear. You can see it in the figure. And over the region they examined, they found that the viscosity goes as x c to the x, where x is about 3. That's the classical reputation value for the predicted concentration slope. That is, if you go up very close to the melt, and these concentrations certainly did so, you can find concentration scaling behavior. I should note that most of the experiments that I have discussed or referenced in the earlier part of the book are confined to regions down here. And there are not a great number of measurements that get beyond about 0.4 volume fraction, meaning about 400 or 350 grams per liter. Um, so Tao et al. explored this area out here, which has been very little studied. And they actually very clearly do find concentration scaling. OK, let us push ahead. Another set of measurements that get out to the melt, but also went down to dilute solution. And these are measurements of Colby et al. The measurements of Colby et al. Um, are seen in figure 12.11. And at lower concentrations, they see a stretched exponential. And at higher concentrations, you carry this out, and you see a power law. However, they did something that many people did not. They used two solvents. 
and one of the solvents was a good solvent and one of the solvents was a theta solvent. So in one solvent they saw this, in the other solvent the viscosity was higher, there's then a crossover. Note that you have to end up here because this is the melt, volume fraction equal one, no polymer, no polymer solvent at all, just polymer, no solvent. And therefore, no matter which solvent you were using, when you get to here, it's the same point. And they saw a second strike power law, which I've plotted here, and there's a crossover someplace. So they actually saw this behavior. Oh, where are these crossovers roughly? Well, in this system, the crossovers are at about phi of 0.03. That's approximate. That is, you've got a lot of concentration range where you see a power law and much less where you see a stretched exponential. All right, <clears throat> another set of measurements. Actually, a whole bunch of sets of measurements. I count myself lucky to have found the key paper. Uh, the key paper is by a Soviet, well, it's now the former Soviet Union, polymer scientist by the name of Drival. And what Drival was able to do was to collect from the Russian literature and the Russian conference literature a very large number of sets of measurements of polymer viscosity uh, at different concentrations, most of which is not available in the Western English language, English alphabet literature. And what he was able to do was to um, say that we did these very thorough measurements. Now, the, thorough, the measurements are thorough in several respects. For starters, the measurements used a range of different instruments, so they cover not the four or five orders of magnitude that were covered in a lot of the other things we've talked about. The viscosities we're about to discuss cover nine or twelve orders of magnitude. That is, the uh, authors started out with dilute solution and they pushed very close to the melt indeed. And therefore, in a number of these figures when we have eta versus concentration, the range of viscosity is 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 12 or whatever. There is a very large change in the, visco the viscosity value. Uh, the other thing that was done was to do, uh, it's been done implicitly in some other papers, certainly, it's not unique here, was to say we are going to vary the shear rate by a great deal. Because we vary the shear rate by a great deal, we can ask, well, is it possible we're looking at a system that is having shear thinning or shear thickening, and therefore the fact that we are seeing our particular results uh, is arising because as we change concentration and other things, the uh, amount of shear thinning we see changes. So they were able to change uh, the um, applied stress by one and a half orders of magnitude, and they found that the measured viscosity did not change. And because the measured viscosity did not change, they conclude they are indeed in the low frequency, low shear region where they are seeing linear viscoelastic behavior. The other thing they did was to look at their measurements and ask what the key variables are. Uh, and what they found was that the key variable is the intrinsic viscosity, eta. Now, eta is the linear leading slope in the viscosity. It's a dilute solution property. However, eta also characterizes roughly how large the intact polymer chain is. And what they demonstrate is they take their measurements for example, figure 12.12. .12. Figure 12.12 .12 are results due to Malkin and collaborators. And in figure 12.12, .12, gee, if you look at it, you notice we're looking at polybutadiene, which is a very conventional polymer, nothing exotic about it. <coughs> 
And having said, we're looking in polybutadiene, we're in the solvent methyl naphthalene. We will plot viscosity versus concentration. So here is viscosity log. And the vertical covers for different materials nine orders of magnitude, which is a lot. And then what they did is they looked at uh, polybutadienes having a wide range of different molecular weights. Now, if you just plot viscosity versus concentration, you would expect to say, well, the low molecular weight material has a viscosity which really needs a lot of concentration to increase. And as we increase the polymer molecular weight, as I'm increasing the polymer molecular weight, the viscosity increases more and more rapidly with increasing concentration. However, what they did was to replot all of their measurements, not as a function of concentration, but as a function of C eta, where eta is the intrinsic viscosity. And suddenly, all of these measurements, which cover lots of range of, con of viscosity, lots of range of concentration, wide range of molecular weights, all of these measurements collapse onto a single curve. That is, eta is a good, the phrase is reducing variable. <clears throat> The um, de behavior of the polymer, how fast it diffuses, even in things very close to the melt, is determined by the size of the entire polymer chain. And if we use eta as the reducing data, we can collapse everything onto a single curve. The single curve is a stretched exponential out to a concentration. And beyond the stretched exponential, there is a power law. Now, as I said, there are large numbers of different measurements that Draval collects. And there, I will drop in a piece, which is, you don't actually see in the Malkin measurements, but you see in some of the others. I will simply note that as you approach the melt, there is a crossover to another increase, which is a little harder to make out in terms of its exact form. The Malkin data look like this. And up here, there is very clearly a C to the X behavior. But all of the viscosities for all of the different polymer molecular weights lie on a single curve if you use the intrinsic viscosity as the reducing variable. Oh, yes, where does this crossover occur? It occurs at C eta of about 20. Um, Eta has another feature. I said that eta is approximately the size of, gives you the size of a polymer chain. Uh, eta has units um, volume per gram. Well, C is grams per volume. Um, C eta, if we ask how concentrated are these chains, well, here's a polymer chain, here's another chain, here's another chain. And if the chains aren't pushed into each other yet, but they're sort of packed shoulder to shoulder. Of course, it's a statistical packing. It's not an exact packing. Uh, if you have packing like this, C eta is some number like a 1 or 4. So these, the crossover occurs when the chains are already considerably overlapped with each other. Those are results of Malkin. Uh, there are other people. For example, here are results of Mokalova. These measurements are done on polyisobutylene. 
They're again all done in the same solvent, which this time is CCL4. And once again, G. These are spectacular in terms of the range of viscosities covered. <coughs> By use of a variety of instruments, there's 12 orders of magnitude of viscosity represented. And we see a stretched exponent in the measurements. There's a stretched exponential. And then there is a nice power crossover to a power law. And at very high concentrations, as the melt is being approached, there is a further increase as though something else is happening. Um, the crossover here in C eta is for something around 30. That is, the crossover is at some concentration much larger than C eta of 1. Um, useful point, it's implicit in this, but I, it, I, it isn't spelled out because of the way things are graphed. These are measurements at, many at a variety of different molecular weights. The use of the intrinsic viscosity has taken measurements done with a series of different molecular weight polymers, measurements that are overlapped in concentration quite considerably, and it has compressed all of the measurements of viscosity to a single curve. Uh, however, if it is able to compress everything to a single curve, then it must be the case that there is a natural viscosity at which this transition occurs, as well as a natural concentration. And that's brought out by other sets of measurements we'll also get to. That is, in order for this compression to work, uh, we have to have the crossover from stretched exponential to power law behavior be occurring at about the same value of eta in all of these different molecular weight polymers. And that is exactly what was found. Um, can we do this again? Well, I could take note of results of Hager et al. <clears throat> Hager et al as represented to us by Draval, look at one polymer, which is a 220 kilodalton polystyrene. And the 220 kilodalton polystyrene um, is studying a whole bunch of different solvents. If you try to use C eta as the reducing curve, you discover, yeah, it doesn't work so well. And you see different curves, and you see crossovers. Uh, however, um, the C eta reduction clearly does not work as well for accounting for changes in solvent strength as it does in accounting for changes in polymer molecular weight. OK. And those are the results collected by Draval. Draval also shows that if you look at the Huggins coefficient, k sub h, k sub h is effective at making certain further reductions in the measurement and generalizations describing what is happening. But I will let him speak for himself in his paper, he and his co-authors. Let us instead look ahead at, at results due to Oshima. So, and this is all, and the results of Oshima et al. are in figure 12.15. They studied a very wide range of polymer molecular weights from 25 kilodalton out to 3,000 kilodalton. They studied my um, a different polymer. They looked at 
polyanhexyl isocyanate and having done that, having looked at this polymer at a range of different molecular weights, they also used two solvents. They used toluene and they used dichloromethane so they varied solvent quality. And having done all this, you can look at the plot. But what the plot shows is viscosity versus concentration. And there is a stretched exponential re regime. And there is a cutoff at about the same viscosity for all of the systems. And above the cutoff, There are power laws c to the x. The value of x ranges, maybe I should have drawn it a bit differently, from 4.9 at one end. And as we increase the molecular weight, x decreases from 4.9 to 3.4. So there are power laws out here. There are slopes of the power laws and exponents, and the exponents themselves depend on polymer molecular weight. Where are the crossovers located? The crossovers are located at eta over eta zero, the reduced viscosity, about 100. Exactly 100, well, not necessarily exactly, but pretty close. If you ask where the crossovers are located, in terms of not the um, viscosity, but in terms of the concentration. The concentration changes a great deal of molecular weight. And C eta is something in the range O4 to 10. However, Oshima shows very clearly and spectacularly the second phenomenology, the transition from a simple stretched exponential to a power law behavior. The exponent of the power law depends on polymer molecular weight, saying the exponent is coupling to other things in the system. And now we reach figure 12.16. The measurements were done in my laboratory by Carol Ann Quinlan. The measurements are viscosity versus concentration. We are looking at a couple of molecular weights of the same polymer. And if you look, you very clearly see stretched exponential behavior and power law behavior. Um, the blow up box in the figure, the inset, shows you a narrow region of the stretched exponential and a, a narrow transition to the straight line power law behavior. What is unusual about the measurements is that there aren't a dozen points or two dozen points on the, those curves. There are more like 70 points or more. The viscosity measurements were done using Ubaloda and Canon Fensky viscometers. Uh, out here, well, there is a largest commercially available viscometer that we could find. As a result, out here, the flow times were on the order of four or six hours. So she would come in the morning, very carefully set everything up, make sure that everything was going, get the experiments going for the next day, and then have not a great deal to do except go to have a nice lunch while waiting for the uh, flow to occur, and the flow occurred um, over a very long time indeed. So while to, uh, tube viscometers can give you fairly high shear rates, because the times were extremely long, the shear rates weren't that high at all. Also, she repeated the experiments with two viscometers, one giving three times the flow time of the other, which means that there were some really long experiments out here. And 
the flow times were exactly proportional in a proper way. That is, you change the flow time by a factor of three, you change the shear rate by a factor of three, and you can't tell which set of points is which by looking at the graph. So we are we're very clearly in the low shear rate. Um, at least one senior editor of one polymer journal, I'll leave his name out of it to avoid embarrassing him, commented that these were probably the best set or most thorough anyhow set of measurements of viscosity of any polymer. And they very clearly show a stretched exponential with very good agreement and the power law, what can you ask? This is a phenomenology that is not the same. Um, okay, <clears throat> and so for hydroxypropyl cellulose as extensively studied, there is a solution-like, melt-like transition. It appears to be a very sharp transition. It appears to be an analytic transition in the sense that if we plot d log eta, d log c. This peculiar choice was made so that if you had a power law, you just get a constant out. If you look at the logarithmic derivative of the logarithm of the function, you see as a function of concentration something that looks more or less like that. The wiggles up here, while well, they're larger than the apparent noise, and we weren't quite sure whether they were real or whether this was an artifact of how we were attempting to extract this derivative from the measurements. Uh, there is buried in there an important lesson. It's very easy if you have sets of measurements to do integrals of the data and get area under a curve. If you're trying to take a derivative of real data, life becomes much more difficult. Here is a smooth curve. Here are points, and if you look at a narrow range of measurements, the signal to noise of the data is such that the vertical variation in the data, these data due to noise, is only moderately less than the variation in the measurement due to the fact that the function itself was changing. And if you attempt to fit this to extract a slope, you run into the difficulty that the derivative becomes noisy. Our solution was this to say we will take overlying packets of five to seven points. We will fit the five to seven points to a, and what works is quite adequately, is a quadratic. Eta is eta zero plus one plus k c plus k two c squared. There are several ways of parameterizing the same quadratic. And the slope is this, and k2 absorbs a fair amount of the noise. Uh, we use five to seven points because if you average over more points, you get a more accurate result. However, if you use five to seven points, gee, the curvature could cause problems. So we say the curvature is adequately described by a quadratic. That's how we pulled our slope out. And what we were able to show was that for this system, not all systems, but this system, uh, the slope actually makes a smooth transition between functions. <clears throat> OK. Now, there are other people we could talk about. <coughs> At not very great length, I shall certainly acknowledge measurements of Ruvers. And Ruvers looked at star polymers. And Ruvers looked at polymers with lots of, star, of arms, like 32 or 64 or 128 or 270. And if you look at those measurements, you say there's a stretched exponential regime. There does appear to be a crossover to a power law regime. The crossover occurs 
at O something like 0.55. That is, the crossover occurs in different systems at different concentrations. The crossover occurs at a very high volume fraction. And the crossover, as you increase the number of arms, tends to look like the sphere crossover in the sense that the slope of the power law region increases. And for the largest arm stars, it really does appear as though the um, measurements of the viscosity on the power, which are on the power law regime, lie above the extrapolation you would have for the stretched exponential. That's exactly the phenomenology you saw for hard spheres. And what the Ruvers measurements show is there appears to be a way to show a continuous transition from linear chains to hard spheres by looking at many armed stars. Okay, we will now advance to figures 23 and 24. And these are measurements of Onogi et al. Uh, the measurements of Onogi et al. appear also in the book by Doi and Edwards, which is mostly a book on polymer theory. However, they do drop in this one set of measurements and discuss what it means in terms of their theory. Uh, if you compare my measurements with the original paper of Onogi and with the book, you discover there are a few data points that do not appear to be in the original figures that clearly Onogi et al. supplied to their um, Japanese collaborator. And so my data is, from, is actually based on the figure in Doi and Edwards. Uh, having said that, what is done in these two figures is to plot viscosity versus molecular weight, and the same data points, viscosity versus concentration. That is, the original authors looked at a given system. They looked at a whole bunch of different concentrations for each molecular weight of polymer. They looked at a whole bunch of molecular weight polymers. And so what they really have is a three-dimensional object, concentration, molecular weight, and viscosity in the vertical direction. What I present in figures 23 and 24 are slices of that three-dimensional object. And if you look at the slices, you see there are bunches of stretched exponentials in molecular weight and concentration. The measurements, which are plotted as log viscosity versus log m or log c, the measurements lie on smooth curves. Uh, this figure is, in a certain sense, a triumph of doing things by computer. Namely, in order to generate the two figures, all that was needed to do was to rearrange a spreadsheet a bit and tell the graphing program where to look. And having done that, one obtains the results seen in the book. Now, why are these um, results of particular interest? There, there's a reason that they're more interesting that is meta-scientific. Namely, these are the measurements that Doi and Edwards cite as proving viscosity is proportional to the molecular weight to some power. And they point at the figure and they say, Here's, here are the results that confirm that you see scaling laws. Now, if you actually look at the original figures, you realize that on a log-log plot, the measurements lie on smooth curves. Smooth curves as a function of polymer molecular weight. Smooth curves as a function of polymer concentration. And therefore, not only do the measurements not prove that there are power law, scaling law behaviors, the measurements, here's the actual data, here are straight lines, the measurements reject the claim that there is scaling law behavior. However, here is one key set of measurements in several respects, namely lots of concentrations, lots of molecular weights, 
They're wonderful measurements. There's no fault in the measurements at all in this respect. And it was a sensible choice to take. Uh, the issue is that by selecting a single set of data, rather than looking at these data and those data and those other data, uh, it was possible to, apparently possible to look and say, well, yeah, there are some modest deviations, but they're just modest deviations. We don't have to worry about them. At least that's what appears to have occurred because the authors simply plowed ahead and indicated they were seeing scaling law behavior when the results don't seem to, as viewed with a more skeptical eye anyhow, don't seem to sustain that claim. Okay, the last thing we can do, and since we're almost out of time, is to discuss what happens when you compare linear and star polymers. And we will be looking for the moment at figure 12.25. And 12.25 shows, as a function of concentration and molecular weight, uh, the um, viscosity of polyisoprenes, it's mostly in tetradecane, it's mostly results of Gracely et al., polystyrene, tetradecane, And there are several noteworthy features. Uh, the first noteworthy feature is that the molecular weight is high enough in the concentration studies. It's a megadalton. And the concentrations cover a range of, oh, 20 to several hundred grams per liter. And when one is talking about molecular weights, the molecular weights are hundreds of kilodaltons or higher and the concentration is 330 gram per liter. So there are two sets of measurements here. There's one with a given polymer molecular weight, which was above a megadalton, looking at um, concentration dependence. And then there was a measurement at fixed concentration using a series of molecular weights. And in both cases, in this system, the viscosity of the linear material what went, does go with c to the x, m to the y. Therefore, if you had been looking for a key experiment that clearly demonstrated good lab, great experimentalist, um, lots of measurements, all of the things you might want. If you were looking for a key experiment, you could have pointed at this one and said, yes, here is a system that does show scaling law behavior. In terms of our picture, where there is a lower concentration solution-like regime, an upper concentration power law melt-like regime, uh, this is a system that shows the solution-like melt-like transition, which only some of them do. And this is a solution in which we are in the melt-like regime. However, there was a comparison made. And the comparison was made with four and six arm stars. So F, the number of arms in the star, was four or six. And what one gets as a function of concentration is curves, and what is immediately visible is that for the star polymer, you are not seeing scaling behavior, you are seeing stretched exponential behavior. The viscosity of the star polymers starts out being significantly less than the viscosity of the um, linear polymer, and as you increase the concentration, or you increase the polymer molecular weight, the curves appear to cross. If you look at the figure and ask, well, yeah, the curves appear to cross, but are there a lot of measurements that are above the crossing? The answer is no. There are only very few points, say one, that is very diff 
clearly in a region where the star polymers are more viscous than the linear polymers. So you've looked at the change in shape and you've actually found an interesting feature, namely there is a solution-like, melt-like transition for line these linear chains, because the measurements are all in the melt-like regime, but for the star polymers, at least over the range that was examined, there is no co corresponding change from solution-like to melt-like. You always see stretched exponential concentration and molecular weight dependencies. Uh, the other figures, for example, 12.26, and uh, show exactly the same thing, namely for branched polymers, you d there is no known system in which you see a, stretch, a stretched exponential to power law crossover. You only see stretched exponential behavior. Um, qualification. The number of studies of solutions of star polymers is much smaller than the number of studies of solutions of linear polymers. There are a lot of systems in which the transition does not occur for linear polymers, and therefore it is possible that if you looked at different star polymers, you would by and by find groups of star polymers that do show the transition. However, you don't see the transition in the systems that have been studied. Furthermore, you don't see the system in a system for which the linear polymer does show the transition. So if you say it's a chemical effect that you see it in some linear chains but not others, it's more complicated than simple chemistry because, gee, the star polymers never show that effect. In any event, I have run us out of time. I have discussed how viscosity depends on a variety of variables. I still have some measurements left to discuss, and we'll discuss the remaining measurements. We'll discuss in the next lecture systematics, how all of these fitting parameters I've described interact with each other, and we may be able to push on. We're approaching where we're going to discuss viscoelasticity of polymer solutions. However, we're out of time, so class is dismissed.